In this segment, we're going to be learning about insulation all over the globe. Now, when we say the word insulation, it sometimes we tend to think of something like you put in your house, like insulation in between your walls or in your attic or in your basement or something like that. So in this sense of the word, we're talking about the word insolation. And really where I like to focus here is that for any of us that speak Spanish or Latin, the word soul here means Spanish in there's a Latin derivation and also soul means sun in Spanish. So what we're talking about here is basically the energy that we receive from the sun insulates and is basically very unequal throughout the globe. And how does that affect us and how does that influence us? So what we understand about the sun is that if we did not have the sun, we would not be alive. The sun is basically like the battery pack for not only everything that grows on planet Earth, but for our weather, for our climate. The sun powers all of that. The sun powers the ocean currents. The sun powers the wind and the wind powers the ocean currents. The wind powers our weather. The weather brings us rain. So the sun powers what brings us rain. Rain brings us water to grow our crops. It brings us water for us as humans. What are the elements that we need as humans, our basic elements? Food, water, and air. Wow. And the sun is responsible for all of that. And what we like to say is that as humans, we eat the sun. We don't literally eat the sun, but we eat things that eat the sun. So think about what you're eating today. If you're having an apple, if you're having a celery, if you're having a green bean or a broccoli or any kind of onion or lettuce or a salad, you are eating something that eats the sun. And where the sun hits on earth depends on what you can do on a daily basis and what we can grow. We call the kind of energy that we're going to be talking about today, solar energy. It's energy that comes from the sun. Many times we don't consider what we get from the sun as energy but it is just that what we get from the sun we consider solar radiation and many times what we think of as radiation is bad there is a spectrum of radiation that i'm going to show you in just a minute some of it is good and some of it is bad but the sun's solar radiation the sun's solar energy is so strong and so immense that every second the sun provides us with energy to meet the world's energy demands for 10 days. Now let's repeat that. Every second, the sun provides us with enough energy to meet the entire world's energy demands for 10 days. That's an enormous amount of energy. Currently, the world economy is driven by burning fossil fuels. Fossil fuels were created over 50 million years ago and are not being created currently. So it's a finite resource and it is non-renewable. Now, what the kind of radiation that we're talking about is solar radiation. When we talk about radiation, it comes in two different wavelengths. It's either going to be a short wave or a long wave. The radiation that we receive from the sun is short wave. Short wave radiation is actually stronger and more intense. Short wave radiation is emitted from the sun. Also, short wave radiation emits an ultraviolet 
visible and infrared radiation. So if you look on your phone today, for example, at the weather, it will also tell you on your weather app what the UV is today. Now, depending on your skin type, you can be out in certain types of UV for longer. So for example, if you have a lighter colored skin, and let's say today or during the summertime, our UV would be maybe around between four and five, it's recommended that lighter skin tones are only out in high UVs for very short amounts of time because we have increased conversations regarding skin cancer, right? So certain types of solar radiation and for certain amounts of time are good for us, but if we are destroying the atmosphere that helps protect us and letting in more ultraviolet radiation, for us that could be bad. We evolved and the earth evolved in order to be an optimal distance from the sun. The flow rate of our solar energy is constant and we measure that rate outside the atmosphere. And we'll be talking about atmospheres later on in our course. The energy that we receive from the sun varies each day and each year and varies by latitude. So that's why we've taken such lengths to learn about the difference in latitude and we've learned about them in degrees. Because depending on what latitude you live in, you will receive different amounts of the sun's energy. And this is where the conversation of daily insulation rates comes in. So, for example, the amount of daily insulation that you receive is going to depend on where you live latitudinally. And I'm going to show you how that works. So say, for example, that you live at the equator. What is the degree of the equator? We consider that zero degrees latitude. What do you think life is like at the equator? First of all, the equator is also the root word for equal. So at the equator, the amount of sun and dark that they receive throughout the year never changes. So think about it, for example, in Southern California, in the winter time, we have longer amounts of darkness. In the summertime, we have more hours of light when the sun is out. At the equator, or in and around the equator, the people who live in those locations do not experience that. They always have 12 hours of day and 12 hours of night. The farther away you get from the equator, the more fluctuation you're going to have in day hours when the sun is out and night hours when the sun is not out. And that will fluctuate depending on the seasons. So as you move toward the poles, you're going to experience more extremes within not only your seasons, not only the amount of light and dark you get throughout the year, but also you're going to experience a difference in the amount of the sun's energy that you receive. How, what is the best way of explaining this? We explain this through, think about this flashlight as being the sun and the flashlight and its rays, right? And where the light is emitted are elements of the sun's radiation. Now, what we're representing here is a location that would be at the equator because we are looking at a straight up and down receiving the most direct sunlight as possible straight down to the equator. The locations in and around the equator receive the most concentrated, the highest, highest amount 
of the sun's energy. It's the most concentrated because it's like shining a flashlight directly, directly at a flat angle. Now, as we go and move away from the equator, the angle of the sun's rays, right? Because if we think about what angle are we at in Southern California, we're at about thir between 32 and 34 degrees. So already the sun's rays, the, the daily insulation rates we receive are going to be more indirect. So now the sun's rays are more spread out on the surface of where we live. Still very strong, but not as intense. Now we move to even more extreme latitudes, like say, for example, up in the Pacific Northwest or up in Canada, the sun's rays are going to be even more indirect and the energy that is received in one surface area here is actually being spread out into two units of surface area. So the sun that people receive at higher latitudes is the sun's energy is going to be more indirect. Think about the things that people can grow in and around the equator. Think about where we have our world's jungles, where we have our world's rainforests. They're in the areas where they receive the highest amount of the sun's energy. And many times we, as children and in earlier grades, are taught that the reason why we have summer is when the earth is closest to the sun, and that is false. The reason why we have seasons is because of the tilt of the earth's axis. The earth's axis is an imaginary line and it runs through the earth at an angle of 23.5 or 23 and a half degrees. The earth has seasons because of this tilt. Since the earth is tilted on this imaginary axis, it means that in the northern hemisphere, we actually in the northern hemisphere are tilted toward the sun in summer, even though in our, in our orbit, we are the farthest away from the sun. So in the northern hemisphere, we, our summer starts June 21st, when we are located the farthest away from the sun, but the reason why we have summer in the northern hemisphere is because of the earth's axis and we're tilted toward the sun. Now, in the southern hemisphere, they are going to be tilted away from the sun during the June solstice, and that is when their winter starts. The inverse happens here. In the northern hemisphere during perihelion, we actually have winter starting when we are almost the closest to the sun, but because in the northern hemisphere we're tilted away from the sun, that's why we experience winter in the northern hemisphere. In the southern hemisphere, December 22nd starts their summer because they are tilted closer to the sun. Now, in terms of the relationship between the earth and the sun, right? If we are so dependent on the sun, it's vital that we understand what this relationship looks like. Now, we have four days that are really important to remember in the earth-sun relationship. Two of them are going to be a solstice, and two of them are going to be an equinox. And now I'm going to explain to you what each of those are now. So if you get confused between the difference between a solstice and an equinox, think about the word equator. Think about the word equal. 
and then look at the word equinox. You're looking at the word equal. We have two equinoxes throughout our solar year, which is 365 and a quarter day. Those two days are in and around March 21st and September 23rd. What does this mean? These are the two days of the year where everyone on the earth receives the same amount of light and dark. And it's very fleeting and it's very quick. Now the other two days of the year that are very important to remember are when we are looking at June solstice and then we're going to be looking at our December solstice. Now for us in the Northern Hemisphere, our June solstice represents our longest day of the year. It also represents our move into the season we call summer. Now summer for everyone around the earth is also different. Summer to some people in certain climates can mean pretty much the same thing. At the equator, they receive the same amount of sun day in and day out throughout the year. So their temperatures and their climate doesn't change very much. For the people who live maybe in the northern parts, so degrees or degrees of latitude that are further away from the equator, they're going to receive more varied extremes between day and night throughout the year. So this is a very welcome solstice for people in the northern hemisphere in what we consider higher latitudes because it means longer days for them because in the winter they will receive the opposite. This also means during the June solstice that this is, will be the start of a 24-hour day for those people who live above the Arctic Circle and that is represented by those who live north of 66 and a half degrees north latitude. Now for those who live 66 and a half degrees south latitude down here in the Antarctic Circle, this will represent a start for them having 24 hours of black of night. Now when we move into the December solstice, this means the opposite for all of us in the Northern Hemisphere. So this means if you live farther away from the equator, your days from the December solstice, the amount of daylight you receive will start to grow. This will be the shortest day of our year. Shortest day meaning the shortest amount of sunlight that we will have in the Northern Hemisphere. What that means is, for example, in the Arctic Circle, this will be a 24 hour period where they will receive no daytime. However, it will be the opposite for those in the Southern Hemisphere. So this represents the Northern Hemisphere winter. This re represents the Southern Hemisphere summer. The amount of insulation that we receive depends on where we are latitudinally. And if you're going to look at this graphic here, you'll notice that the highest, the most concentrated amount of solar radiation or solar energy, sun's energy, is received at the equator. And that's what we're looking at right here. This angle of sunlight is coming in most direct. You will notice the angle that as you start to go up higher into your latitudes, you will notice, see the angle received right here by the sun to the earth. This energy is going to be more spread out and less concentrated. Now look at this angle here. The sun's rays that are received here, even higher latitudes here and here, are going to be even more 
spread out and even less concentrated. So it means that the sun's energy is going to be spread out more, whereas here it's more concentrated. So solar radiation is strongest near the equator and weakest nearest the poles. And seasonal changes in a day and length and vary by latitude. And you get more extremes the farther away you move from the equator. And again, I like to show this graphic to represent if, for example, you were taking a flashlight and shining it on one tile on the ground. At the equator, this is what represents the sun's energy will be so concentrated within that one square tile. For example, when you get up into higher latitudes, the sun's energy will be spread out over two tiles. And again, this is a review of the two solstices, our June and December. And this graphic here represents the various latitudinal areas of our Earth. So Southern California is considered subtropical because we are within the 35 to 25 degrees north latitude. So for example, you would take from Santa Barbara to San Francisco all the way to Seattle. They're all considered within the mid-latitude regions. In the subtropical area, we can grow things like oranges, like avocados, like lemons. In these mid-latitude areas, it's nearly impossible. It, it can be done in the valley, in the Great Valley of California, but over only in the lower parts closer to L.A. Think about the things that we grow in tropical areas that you get at the store. For example, coffee, right? We can't grow coffee here in subtropical or in the mid-latitudes. Bananas. Think about all of the different fruits that you can grow in these tropical areas as well. How many fruits and vegetables do you recall getting from this subarctic level? We don't, right? Because the sun's radiation is not as strong. These areas are not receiving as much energy as these areas down here along the equator and the tropical and subtropical areas. For example, the latitude of where we're at here down here in Los Angeles is about 34 degrees north and 118 degrees west right here. So here's California and here's where we're at. Oop. So here's that 33 degree mark. Here's that 34 degree mark. So it's right about in the middle.